opportunity to actual content creation over the next few weeks, which I think is quite exciting. So watch out for all the other webinars. Um, but today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how we can change narrative and achieve our goals using social media and digital channels. Um, when I used to do these presentations before, I was uh, I would concentrate way more on social media, but now I think it's quite important for us um, in in the age of sort of uh, post COVID world where we've um, realized how dependent our lives are on digital uh, to also include other channels that we may not traditionally think about. So. Um, just a bit about me, uh, as Maya said, I'm um, Val and I'm the head of digital engagement at Amnesty International, um, based in London, and if you can follow me on Twitter and on Instagram, you can see my handles here. If you ever have any questions, if you ever need any advice on your strategy, on, on ways to move forward with your digital campaigning or with social media, please feel free to reach out to me um, in public. I as, uh, like to sort of be able to answer questions to the benefit of everyone um so please do so publicly and i'll get back to you um as soon as i can on if you want to go into detail and on some of this stuff that i'll be talking about today so if i say social media what does it make all of you think about and usually when we do this people sort of take some time out to look for articles that have recently spoken about social media and the stuff that you usually find um, it's quite negative and it's quite quite uh, alarming, right? So from everything from you know Cambridge Analytica to trolls online to the spread of fake news to the effects that social media has on mental health. But the question that I always like to ask in the very beginning is um, sort of, is it all that bad? Is social media and digital only a tool for for bad stuff in the world, or is it something that we can actually use to our benefit? Um, and the answer to that is quite simple, is that we've all seen in recent years that social movements worldwide have been fostered through the use of social media and digital marketing. Um, and there's a lot of different examples. Um, it's important to remember that, you know, social movements might not be started on social media, but they definitely grow uh, because of digital and social media. So if you want to drop in the chat, um, any ideas of, of um, for inspiration of sort of social movements that have been fostered through the use of social media, please do so. Um, and um, and then Maya will will stop me if you guys can if 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 um, you have any ideas that we can also discuss. Um, but the ones that I usually like to highlight, um, first of all, is. Obviously, I'm Ukrainian, and for me, a very big part of what has inspired my work has been the revolution in Ukraine, the more recent one. Um, and if you see in the middle, uh, there's a book still on my bookshelf that is basically 700 pages of real history of the revolution through Facebook posts of people. Um, and it just really shows how Facebook was used as a tool to organize, to spread messages, and to make the revolution uh, sort of as strong as, as it ended up being. Um, I can see in the chat, yes, NSARS campaign in Nigeria. It's an incredible also example um, of how people use social media to mobilize, to organize, to educate um, in recent years and, and continuously so particularly right uh, this year. Thank you so much, Kemi, for that example. Obviously, the Black Lives Matter protests have been using digital really well to their advantage to mobilize and organize. Uh, Me Too has been a big sort of um, push for, you know, women to be able to express themselves uh, using digital channels as well. There's many, many examples, but I hope that this just shows you that, you know, social media and digital isn't all about trolls and fake news and bots and, you know, whatever it may be that is in the press that is negative or, you know, Mark Zuckerberg in front of answering questions about how awful Facebook is. Yes, there's a lot of problems. Yes, there's a lot of things that we can do. But in a lot of places, social media is actually one of the only ways to challenge traditional concepts of information and power. It's the only way to challenge authorities on a lot of the topics and a lot of these discussions. So for example, particularly, you know, just to use the example that I was given before on NSARS, uh, digital and social media has been used to sort of counter some of the narratives um, that the government has been promoting, some fake narratives and really um, it has given the right to grassroots movements and organizers to use those channels to their own benefit. And the problem is that authorities in certain countries, if not all of them, have realized how important social media and digital have been for the spread of dissenting voices. 
Um, and this has definitely led us into these guys and many more than just these being very good at using social media and digital. And I think the, the main problem is that they've, they've uh, found something that we couldn't do before as you know, civil society organizations, as activists, is that they knew that they were, um, it was important for them to one, give answers to, to people that they couldn't find otherwise in the mainstream media in, in various other channels. And two, they also found that it's important to build communities using digital channels because people go online to look for connections. Um, they're really good at it. Unfortunately, we're not as good at it most of the time. Um, and we just really need to refocus our efforts in understanding and structuring our digital campaigns and our digital efforts and strategy in a more cohesive and data-led way so that we learn from what we do. And the reason for that is that as of last year, over half of the world's population uses social media. It's a massive audience for us to be able to reach. Um, and you know, more than, I think now it's even more, when I was doing these slides, it was uh, a little bit far back, but 59% of the people around the world, that was last year where you had access to the internet. Now I think it's, I'll show you the next slide around 61. That's a big part of our world of people who use um, digital and, and social media and internet. Um, and this means that we need to be able to be on all digital platforms in a structured, um, and cohesive way with a clear goal of what we're trying to do by giving people answers and by connecting them with each other. So a little bit on, uh, these are the latest stats now, um, as of 2021, uh, for the use of digital and social media in the world. Um, so basically, yeah, this is as of January 2021. If any of you want to know more around uh, statistics and specific platforms, specific, dem specific demographics, specific countries, if you go on datareportal.com, it's a really, really long report with really in-depth information um, around all of this. You can really drill down into, um, into the very sort of specifics of what you need to find out about how people use digital. And this is sort of like, I would say the, the main guiding book of all social media managers and digital strategists in the world. Um, this helps us really formulate what we wanna do, how we wanna do it and who we want to engage. And as you see, as of 2021, 66% um, of the population uses mobile phones, 59% um, of the population uses the internet and uh, there is 4.2 billion, so 53% active social media users. So I hope this shows to you clearly why we need to be using digital channels and platforms. This is actually something that I'm um, really, I was really interested in looking at when this report came out, is that we can actually see some of the top reasons for why people use social media. And this is for global internet users aged 16 to 64, so quite a wide range. So the number one, um, reason that people use uh, social media is to stay up to date with news and current events. And this is going to be very important for us, for, for people within the civil society space, because um, I will talk more about being reactive and influencing the news agenda. But this essentially shows why we need to be focusing on reactive um, and news, even though we work within the nonprofit sphere. Second reason is find funny or entertaining content, also something that we can use to our advantage, fill up spare time, um, also something we need to keep in mind when we're developing content, for example, uh, you know, people are not necessarily paying full attention uh, to their phones when they're when they're on, you know, they might be on the go, they might be, I don't know, going for a walk, doing their laundry, and they might be checking their social media from now and then. So we really need to take into account some of these audience kind of um, actions and behaviors when we're developing uh, our strategies and our content. And then the fourth one is to stay in touch with friends and family and with what they're doing. So create that sense of community with other people. Um, I think it's very important to make this point that you need to be able to pick your platforms carefully. It's very easy to spread yourselves thin and, you know, try to be on every single platform. And, you know, you know, there's TikTok, then there's Clubhouse, which is new. There's so many different new things that you're constantly chasing and trying to find. But what we really found in 2021, that each platform has become very specific for what you want to do on it and who you want to reach on it. No sort of, yes, there are some similarities obviously between Facebook and Instagram because they're similar, but they're still different. You know, they're owned by the same company, but they're still different. And what's really important to understand is that all these platforms are used by people for different things. So for example, you can see Facebook is still the highest used um, 
platform, but that is obviously a platform that is used by a lot of people to stay connected with others, to uh, organize themselves. So for example, I know that so, some, so um, just trying to remember, um, there's so March for Our Lives, you know, the, the activist um, the group in the US um, who are against gun violence, they actually use Facebook to organize themselves. Um, and to be able to kind of host meetings and things like that. Uh, YouTube is also very different. It's very educational. YouTube is a really interesting platform that a lot of us have forgotten about. A lot of NGOs use it as a repository of content. But actually, if you have a strategy, it's one. It's the second biggest social media platform. And what we found in COVID-19 is that actually a lot of misinformation was spread on YouTube because people go to YouTube for information and for educational material. And for example, um, I think WHO realized that they were not using YouTube to their advantage and um, they were not actually creating YouTube first educational content that could counter some of this fake misinformation that was being spread on the platform. It's also, I think, the second, obviously after Google, uh, highest search, like basically highest used search engine in the world. Um, messaging app, messenger apps, again, very interesting, very important in a lot of different countries. Uh, these are the main platforms for social media use. I know that, for example, in Eastern Europe, Telegram is a really big platform that a lot of people use to share information. A lot of activists use it as well to organize, to uh, educate. And, and so we really need to look at the specifics of what we want to achieve and then look at which platforms would be best suited for us to do that. And I think my favorite kind of statistic and fact is that, not a statistic and fact, but development is that Instagram used to be a place where we would share like, I don't know, pictures of avocado toast and our morning run and I don't know, a yoga session. But actually as of last year, Instagram has morphed into an information powerhouse. So platforms can develop, platforms can grow um, and we can really sometimes form the way that people use those platforms as sectors, not just as one organization, but as, 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 as sort of, uh, you know, for example, the NGO sphere, we can, we can really use that platform and change the way that people use it. So it's become a real place um, for a hub for information and advocacy, super important for NGOs. A lot of us, again, overlook it but really, really important uh, in making sure that your strategy uh, achieves your advocacy and educational goals. Um, so obviously before writing a good press release used to be pretty much enough for, for a lot of organizations, but the media landscape has changed quite significantly as I showed you with the use of digital and social media. And there are now other ways to shape the narrative and make news. Um, you can make news, you can break news on social media, uh, you can also comment on news and insert your unique perspectives into the discussion. And these are just a few examples uh, from a while back that I use from Amnesty International. It's very hard to make your own topics trend, but it's very easy and also sometimes really influential and important to insert your unique opinions and unique comments into ongoing discussions. So for example, if you see the tweet on the bottom, uh, it was when the US uh, left the UN Human Rights Council. We knew that it was happening. And literally 12 minutes after the announcement was made, we had a pre-prepared um, tweet to go out to comment on what was happening, on, on the situation, which was quite tongue in cheek. Um, and actually all of the media organizations were quoting the tweet, not our press release, because it was way more engaging and faster. It obviously takes a long time to write a press release, approve it, get it out. But a tweet is something that you can really it's, it seems small and insignificant, but can be super powerful in uh, influencing the news agenda. But it's super important, as I said before, to not just look at social media, but to look at all of the digital channels that we have, right? Um, this is how people use the internet, digital. They're not just on social media channels. Uh, they, there's also the, your websites that you visit. Um, there's paid advertising, there's email marketing, there's influencers who are outside of what you own in terms of your channels. And there's also media partners who can all help you amplify your messages and engage your people. So when you're thinking about starting a campaign, when you're thinking about planning a campaign, or even when you're looking at your general digital strategy, you have to be able to integrate all of these channels and create strategies that intersect them all and take a person, a user on a journey and also um, sort of reach them at different points of their sort of digital life, if you can say that, right? At different points of like 
how they use um, different touch points for how they use digital channels. So this is something that I think a lot of um, the digital marketing people in other industries have been sort of doing and 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 um, propagating for, I guess. Uh, so digital always has to be data driven and audience focused. We need to be able to test everything that we do. We need to be guided by clear sort of performance stats, but we also need to be receptive to feedback from our audiences because what we're trying to do is we're trying to get our messages out to people and to make those people respond to our messages and do something about it. We need clear goals. We need to be adaptable and amplify what works well. And what this means is that we need to work in sprints. We need to work in cycles, right? And I'll go into more detail on this with specific examples, but we need to be able to start as we always do with a goal. What are we trying to achieve, right? Then we go into strategy, which I'll take you through next. Once we have our strategy, we develop creative. Once we develop creative, we produce it. Um, but this, at this point, should be your minimum viable product, right? It should be something small. Don't commit big budgets to ideas that you think will work. Like you should never ever operate on assumptions of what your audience might like. You should test that assumption. You should test those assumptions before committing big budgets. You need to be adaptable once again and amplify what is working well, not what you think may work well. So once you've created something, produced it, you launch and test it. This doesn't have to be just on paid marketing. You just put it out on your social accounts, right? And a lot of social media managers, the reason they're good at their jobs is because they can constantly see how content performs. It's a daily job, right? You always see like, okay, this is working better. This is working worse. So I'm going to do more of what's working better. If it's on a specific campaign, you may want to uh, use paid marketing and test some of your sort of uh, paid ads and some of your creative and see whether people are um, with a bit of budget, whether people are responding to it, how they're responding to it, what they're saying. The most important part of this sort of cycle is the reporting bit. You need to then report on how this all performs. And then what you need to do is adapt your goals and strategies based on the results that you found. So you need to be always, always in the cycle whenever you're working on campaigns or on, on ongoing projects. You need to be a little bit more nimble and agile. I know these are buzzwords, but you just need to be open to changing things based on the results that you get and this is maybe very hard in operating when you need to ask for budget from your managers or you need to ask for resources or something else because you you kind of like, you know, they usually ask, okay, how much money do you need? But, but what this allows you to do is to ask for a little bit, test it, and then be able to scale it up and really, really uh, make sure that the money that you're investing or the time that you're investing, not just money, can be used in a way that will bring you the results that you want. So the strategy bit. And this is the bit that is adaptable based on these growth sprints, right? But there are four steps to any successful digital strategy. Um, and some of it can be more campaign focused and more like nonprofit focused and change focused. This is also applicable if you're trying to, you know, work on, I don't know, maybe selling tickets to an event or something like that. So it's just, it's, it, it's adaptable to any um, sort of form of digital activity, but in particular, this is something that is super important for um, the NGO sphere and, and people who sort of operate within activism circles because we forget to do this sometimes, right? We get so into our topics and into our discussions that we completely forget to structure what we want to achieve and what we want to do. Um, and so there's four steps, as I said. One is we need to clearly identify what change we're trying to achieve but not just in general, what change we're trying to achieve, what change we're trying to achieve through digital mobilization. And what's really important, and I know that some of you were in the, in the session last time, um, the last session last Thursday, is to think about the world that we want to see, right? We need to be able to get better at building a picture of where we want to go, uh, because we get really lost sometimes in, in sort of what's wrong with the world right now, and we forget about what's the world we want to build and um, there's there's some really good people who can talk you through more of that if you ask Anna and Maya um, as well. But with digital, it's how can digital mobilization help you achieve that? Second point is how will you measure your success in practice on digital channels? And I'll talk about this in a second. Third is who is your target audience and what channels do they use? You really need to start understanding your audience and their behaviors 
And four is what are the key moments in your campaign and how can you develop a content strategy and a timeline that will help you implement your, um, your project. So for example, let's take as an example, uh, what change are you trying to achieve through digital mobilization? So we want um, fake news to not be around COVID-19 to not be a thing in Ukraine. So we want to fight fake information around COVID-19 in Ukraine. This can be anything, but it should be something that is quite uh, solid that, you know, there is an action that, that you want to achieve through the work that you're doing with digital mobilization. And then second, how will you measure that success? How will you know that you're successful in practical terms using digital stats? And the thing that I usually uh, sort of go back to, um, and this is from some of the sort of courses that I've heard from other people is really understanding what is your one metric that really matters. There's a million of different metrics you can think about, right? You can think about, I don't know, reach on a specific campaign or something else, or, you know, you can get lost in, in different metrics. Um, but it's really important to understand for your particular campaign, what is that one thing that will show your success? So for example, is it that people participate in an action and send 500 emails to authorities? Or is it that um, if it's an educational campaign, is it that 2000 people share educational content on Instagram to fight fake news? Or is it something completely else? Um, it's really important to remember that there's a thing called vanity metrics. And Anna asked me to talk a little bit about this as well, which is these are metrics that don't tell us anything about what we need to do next, right? Um, they're good to look at. For example, you know, our campaign reached 3 million people, but there's no guidance for what we need to do next. It doesn't tell you what we need to sort of adapt and what we need to change um, and and it doesn't give you that sort of indication of whether you're being successful right so it really needs to be connected to your first goal in order to be able to, to be like to, for you to be able to implement your strategy and know if you're being successful so some other vanity metrics include like followers you know sometimes if you're for example trying to engage people in a meaningful way if you're trying if, to ask them to take action on a i don't know sign a petition then, then followers on your Facebook account are not really going to be a metric that tells you anything. Um, conversion rate on your website might be something that is a bit more tangible than, and then can sort of explain to you better and let you know what, what you need to do next. Uh, but some metrics are not really useful um, in understanding how to adapt your strategy. Uh, so I'm just looking at the comments. I can see... I can answer that. Yeah. So audience behavior. Good question. I'll come to that in one second. So once you have your what change are you trying to achieve and you understand what is the metric you will use to calculate success. So, for example, people share our informative content 10,000 times on Instagram. And just a, a pro tip, Instagram now prioritizes um, shares and saves as a as a action for a user. So watch out for that and use that in your strategy if you're really create content that people want to share or save. Um, so once you have those two, you go into the third one. Who is your target audience and what channels do they use? There's a million of different ways to understand audiences. There's funnels, there's pyramids, there's whatever you want. Um, but essentially, the whole point of it is that you have three types of audiences. You have cold audiences who have never heard about you, who have never heard about your campaign, who also probably have never heard about the issue um, and are very hard to reach. There are warm audiences who might be interested in what you're doing, right? They might know you, they might follow you, they might just look at your website, they might see you in, in a news article by, I don't know, the BBC or something, but they don't actually engage with your content. And then, then there are engaged audiences, which are the super active people who participate, who take action, who tell others about it, who maybe give you money, who, who do whatever it is that shows an activity on it within your sphere, right? Um, and when you're planning campaigns, it's really important to choose who you're going to try and talk to, right? You can talk to all, you can try talking to all, right? You can try talking to cold audiences, warm audiences, engaged audiences, but it's important to really understand them in that way because that will then help you um, divide your content strategy and really create content that will let you convert the people up in this pyramid. So from not engaged people to observers, to followers and et cetera, et cetera. But you might 
never be able, for example, to quickly convert someone from completely cold and unengaged to straight away the, the most engaged uh, activist in your sphere, right? It takes time and it takes a strategy to convert people up that pyramid. Um, and there will be less and less of them, but they will just be more engaged, right? So, so, the, so the way that you also spend your time and effort will be defined by the type of people and the type of audiences that you will want to engage in your campaign and who's really important for you. So I'm also, once you do identify that, you really need to think about sort of who they are, what platforms do they use? How can you reach them? What country are they in? And there's a lot of that information I showed you on datareportal.com. It's free, you don't need to use any tools. And you can really drill down into your understanding of who those people are. Um, tools, I see that there was a question about tools. There's loads of different tools. How do you track and measure the movement of those people? Very good question. You can do that on Google Analytics if you set up tracking in, in the correct way. Uh, but in, in a more sort of day-to-day uh, -day way, it's, it's, it's a little bit harder to be able to track it. But you will, you will see at least for your most engaged people, like for example, your activists and your donors, you're definitely going to have data on them, right? So you'll see... Um, whether they're you know donating or whether they're taking extra actions and it's about having sort of an infrastructure as well i'm not going to talk about this now that's a whole other session and there are people who can talk about this better than myself but digital infrastructure is extremely important in making some of this happen as well so having a you know centralized data management system that will let you track these things um, is important of course you can use sort of your analytics and stuff that is within platforms um, which is what I'm going to go on to next. But it's also quite important if you do want to really measure the movement of these people, uh, you need to be able to have those systems in place like G Google Analytics, like a good CRM, like a good um, uh, you know, campaigning tool to be able to track how these people move up, right? From follower to contributor to donor and et cetera. These are the tools that you can use. Some of these are free, some of these are not. Um, so for example, uh, Facebook Analytics, Twitter, Google Trends are all uh, tools that you can use for free. Twitter Advanced Search. You can drill down into how people use your uh, use the channels, and this is really the people on your account. Like Facebook Analytics is people on your accounts. Google Trends. You can see general trends of how people behave. Um, Twitter Advanced Search can be used for various things. CrowdTangle is free, but you need to ask Facebook to get it. Um, and Basically, Crimson Hexagon, which is now I think called Brand Watch, um, and Newsweb are paid for tools. Uh, Newsweb shows you what what news stories people are interested in and how you can take advantage of ongoing conversation. And then uh, Crimson Hexagon is does a really deep dive into Twitter um, Twitter behaviors and uh, kind of also trending topics and things like that. So it really depends on the level of um, sort of tech maturity that your organizations have, but also there are free tools to be able to do that. Datareportal.com is another really good tool um, to really drill down into your target audiences. So, okay, we have our change, we have what we're measuring, and now we have our target audience. So um, obviously I'm doing this very quickly, but uh, our target audience, for example, is young people in Ukraine who are really active on Instagram and are also interested in social is justice issues. So those are our warm audiences, right? So as soon as we have all those three things, and by the way, these are still all assumptions because we haven't tested anything. Um, we are going into the content part of what we're going to do. And to be able to do that, we need to understand all the previous three points, but also understand what are the key moments for us externally in the world uh, that can help us um, kind of promote our campaigns and get people interested in our campaigns. And this is what will help us define our content strategy, but also timeline. So when we do talk about content strategy and timeline, I always recommend dividing it into four different subtypes across all of our different channels. And the reason is that, for example, if you are an organization that, um, for example, sells educational webinars, um, you don't want to only talk about sign up to, to this webinar. That's your third point, which I'm going to talk about action based content. But you also want to give people something that is um, of value to them. So I usually divide content into four types, educational content, value based content, and then action content, but also reactive. And I'll go into um, a little bit more detail into why. 
So educational content, whatever campaign you're doing, is super important for warm audiences who agree in theory with what you're doing, but they just don't know enough about the topic or why they should care about it, right? These tend to be on controversial topics. These tend to be on topics that, you know, there may be a lot of fake news around. It's topics that people are a bit afraid of. Like, I don't know, if I can, I mean, the one, the most sort of fresh and ongoing one in my mind is sort of, you know, the conversation around consent, um, some people, you know, shy away from talking about it, um, but with more information, with more understanding, with more facts, those warm audiences who in theory agree with you, but just don't have enough information, can you can bring them on your journey to, to eventually, you know, make them part of your movement, make them part of your campaign, and ask them as a result to do something. So you can see loads of examples we've done at Amnesty, um, sort of from, you know, infographics on how climate change affects human rights to ways that we can sort of uh, unite and and um, be respectful during covid to facts about rape to 10 things that have changed in the us since the black lives matter protest began so this is really for those warm audiences and i always recommend having this because it's really important it's also really important when you're doing paid because you need to be able to explain to people why they should care about what you're trying to ask them to do so the next one is um, values-based content, also super important. Um, and this is content that will help us reach colder audiences who may agree, but they just need more convincing based on our um, on, on their values. So they, they might agree, they might disagree, but if we really take into consideration the values that we all share with each other uh, as human beings, our humanity, our common humanity, then we can really try and convert them um, into understanding sort of um, our issues and our topics that we're trying to do. And this is what I was talking about earlier. It's sort of, um, these are the, the type of content that helps us shape uh, the world that we want to see after our campaign is finished, after what we've done is achieved, after we've been successful. So for example, a good example of what we've tested at Amnesty is the graphic in the middle. No one can disagree that we all have the right to be treated equally, right? It's not a, it's not a controversial thing to say. But the way that we, so for example, sometimes obviously when we talk about, you know, LGBTI issues, um, we may get some pushback and, and, and things like that. So the way that we reframe it is we focus on the values that we all share as human beings to be treated equally. That is very hard to argue with. Um, and that is very sort of, it's easier to convince people to participate in whatever you're doing based on something that they can really relate to as human beings, right? Something that they will share and they will want other people to know that they agree with that. And this is also, again, quite important for paid because that's how you get completely cold audiences to come on board, but also just important in general in talking um, to some people who, who you might struggle to get on board sometimes. And then, and then the fourth bit is once you've educated, you've given the educational content, you've given the value-based content, your audiences now are open and willing to also take action and participate in your campaign. This is also what actually makes us stand out from news um, organizations because we can talk about news that is happening, but we can also give people something to do. So this is what at Amnesty I think is super important is that like, apart from just talking about ongoing reactive issues and topics, and trending topics, we actually give people an option of uh, getting involved. So they, they're not just, you know, simple bystanders, but they can actually do something that might have a have an impact on on um, on the topic that they're interested in on the on the story that they're interested in. So yeah, there's a lot of examples that I can give you. But you know, some people sometimes, you know, they doubt petitions and doubt like, actions on the website and things like that. But for example, recently we were doing some work on Ethiopia um, and we launched a campaign where we asked our supporters to send an email to um, one of the authority figures. And actually, as a result, the authorities started replying to our supporters, which means that they were paying attention to what we were doing. But in order to be able to start those campaigns, in order to be able to activate your people, your most engaged segments, you really need to first do the educational content the value-based content to then ask people to participate in what you want them to participate in. And then the third one is reactive content, my favorite type of content. Um, and this is for new audiences um, who, who basically like they might understand, they, they know, they might, you know, they care about the trending story. They don't really care about what, what your organization has to say. But if you, um, in a way, insert yourself 
into ongoing trending conversations, you can really, really, really get new um, followers and supporters to participate in the work that you do because A, you're inserting your unique perspective, B, they see that you're cool and that you care about what they care about, um, and C, they just understand it better because you're speaking in the language that they understand. Um, so my favorite ever example, which is uh, something that we did um, with Amnesty Argentina is the one in the middle, uh, when the finale of Game of Thrones um, happened, sorry, spoiler alert, um, basically we published this graphic, uh, we had at that time really sort of in-depth report on Raqqa, Syria and, and, and a city that was destroyed, um, and, but we did know that people cared about, you know, obviously everyone cared about the most disappointing finale of Game of Thrones ever, um, and we're discussing it quite intensely, but we knew that we had an opportunity to bring our traditional amnesty report into the light of uh, the ongoing discussion on um, Game of Thrones. So we did this graphic, uh, and it will, I think it's still one of our top performing graphics ever with, you know, loads of people were sharing it because it just showed the amnesty is a human being who cares about uh, trending discussions, but also uses that as an opportunity to talk about important and serious uh, topics traditional to amnesty. It's really important. So if you're seeing news stories that you feel like, or, or things that are being discussed that you feel like you can really add value to, and it doesn't have to be just, you know, funny sort of meme based content. It can be anything, um, but it's just really important to monitor that and understand how it works. Um, and what is important to understand, so it's important to understand your timeline, how you're going to roll out your campaign, what you're going to do, and you need to plan your content according um, to what you're trying to do and and sort of uh, in in uh, sorry i was just panicking because it said my internet wasn't working but if you can hear me then i'll continue um basically we um, we're a bit frozen okay. but we can hear you i'm still oh, frozen it's good. it's good now it's good now yeah um and basically yeah plan it out um and as you can see stagger the four different types of content so you might have educational content on facebook and on instagram to start with whilst at the same time running ads for example with value-based content to bring in new audiences and once they're ready you then um create content to ask people to take action and participate you might also have run a sort of a series of media oriented content on twitter because that's where most journalists are whilst constantly monitoring news and producing reactive and trending stories to get those new audiences on board with you. So once again, I've taken you through the four stages sort of of um, a strategy, a digital strategy and how you can create it. But it's important to test and iterate all of the assumptions that you've made while creating the, the strategy. Um, using your channels and doing it in real time, publishing content, you know, making, not committing big budgets straight away, not committing a lot of time, but sort of creating a graphic, say, with a framing that you're amplifying what you're doing already really well and what is working well. So remember, I showed you that cycle um, of a digital growth sprint that is super important uh, for all of us as digital people to, to take on board and um, continue. And one of my favorite sort of uh, lines that a friend of mine, Dante, at, from IFRC, always says about content, about digital strategies, and about sort of human behaviors, whenever you're working on campaigns, as I said, it's so important to be stuck in sort of your little bubble of, of that topic, right? So it's, you might think that it's the most interesting topic ever and that everyone's gonna read it tomorrow and today and share it with 3 million people. But you really need to take a step back and say, Will your neighbor or your, I don't know, friend who doesn't know what you do or doesn't know anything on the topic or doesn't know anything about this, will they share that piece of content? Will they want to be associated with your campaign on digital channels? Because digital channels at the end of the day have become sort of like our second, um, yeah, our, our second uh, sort of, I don't know what to even call it profile you know it's like our profile so if whatever you share it's a, you you're immediately associated with the source of that um and so it's really important whatever you're doing to always go back to this question will your neighbor share your piece of content or your campaign um and will they want to be associated with it and if not then how can you make sure that they do 
So I'm going to quickly finish on some useful tips in general on social and on digital, but it's always to, really important to be authentic and de define your own voice as an organization, as a person. Um, and basically about just, you have to sound like you're semi, you know, normal human being and not a robot on, on, on digital, on social. Um, and just be really authentic. It's, it, it, it's fun persona and, and personality on social and on digital across all of your channels. So make sure also that they're not different across your social and your paid and your email. It needs to have a style and a voice. Um, social media is also not a one-way conversation. It's important to, it's not a one-way sort of, you know, monologue. Uh, it's important to have conversations, join conversations and connect with people. Um, it's something that I was talking about earlier, but something that it's really important for us all to keep in mind. Um, uh, the other thing, as I said just now about the neighbor, the third thing is when writing for social media, assume that people know nothing. You have to explain things to people. You have to sort of uh, tell them and explain all the you know details of it because assuming that people understand what you're talking about is not something that will get us very far. Um, post rich media, photos, links, videos, give people something to do, uh, engage them. Five is pick your platforms. As I said, different platforms are good for different things. Six is don't forget to look at your performance stats because that's the only way to get better. And seven, post regularly and be consistent with how you do it. And I will stop there. Thank you everyone so much. And I'll pass it back to Maya. Wow, thank, no, thank you so much. Um, this has been so rich and I think everybody who listened can agree there's a lot to digest, uh, but like Anka mentioned, you will have the access to, uh, you meaning the participants will have the access to the slides, so you don't worry if you missed, uh, uh, if you didn't copy the uh, uh, any materials you, uh, uh, you might find useful, we'll send it to you. But uh, Val, you've answered some questions uh, uh, already, but we, uh, we've gotten a, a, a little bit, uh, a few more since uh, then. Um, and so maybe we can start with, uh, you've talked about this a little bit uh, uh, in your tips, but uh, Michał, asks uh, about how to keep people warm, describing a situation where they had an event that due to COVID was delayed uh, and they experienced a lot of uh, dropout, which is, I think, something we can all uh, see happening that, uh, yeah, there's less and less people, people have less and less uh, endurance, I would say, to, to join online meetings. So how do, you, how do you keep people warm and prevent them from, from sort of losing uh, interest? Just, um... Yeah, I, I, as I said before, like, and I don't know what you did. Um, so it will be if you want to talk conference. about it later. It was a conference, yeah. So so a bit different than a campaign, but yeah. So like, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. No, no, no. I mean, like, what kind of content you did have during that time? But it's sort of important to, as I said before, that's why I think it's really important to have different types of content. And I was talking about, you know, the four different types: so educational, value based, and and sort of participatory. You can't constantly ask people to just join your conference and keep them warm. You need to keep them engaged with other things. So, for example, I can tell you this. I don't know if I'm. Uh, so I worked for Women's March Ukraine um, um, this last March, obviously, um, in March, 8th of March. And obviously, once the March happens, the content strategy shifts, right? Like, what are you going to talk about now? What are you, How are you going to keep your audiences engaged? So what we did, we were actually starting to monitor what was happening in, in the news, which was related to our topic. So there were a lot of sort of, there was a court hearing about sort of a serial rapist in one of the cities in Ukraine uh, and and the, the failure of the justice system to address that so we just commented on that conversation and kept people updated on on similar topics and really like making sure that that your main point of like what your conference was about maybe or what what your end goal was about that's why it's important to like set up your end goal you keep talking about it through reactive and trending stories um, that people will be interested in anyway but you're just adding your value and adding more to that conversation. And also, I think um, things that, again, the point about sharing is like super important. So I think content that you think people will find useful and will want to share with your, with their friends, with their family is super good for keeping audiences warm. So for example, you know, if your conference is on, I don't know what it can be on digital stuff, then if you create, uh, you know, content that will have like top five tips of developing your social presence uh, and you will have content around it that is sort of like uh, little 
bits of your conference in graphics format or videos format that people will find useful and will want to share with others because it's educational that might also uh, keep them engaged but it, it also really depends on like what your conference is about what your webinars are about and what you're doing and and how you're engaging people so i hope that answers it a little bit yeah definitely um but there's another one uh, from katarina who's asking about your reaction and how do you handle all the negativity that is related with uh, uh, social media, as she mentions that sometimes she gets an impression that there are more negativity and less questions and positive reactions. Yeah, uh, I will tell you a secret and it's a pro tip of any social media manager, don't read comments. Um, I mean, no, you should read comments because that's how you understand how people react um to your stuff but basically like and i found this at amnesty always is that like no matter what we put out people will be unhappy with something right you put out something on ethiopia they'll say why are you not talking about ukraine you put out something on ukraine they'll say why are you not talking about the us and it's like this constant thing and people will always have issues and they'll have things that they will complain about and things like that my main sort of uh, first of all, take care of yourself because reading bad negative comments is not great for your mental health. So try to distance yourself from that. Don't do it all the time. Don't check your phone before going to bed. If you do that, I used to do that. Not a good thing. Um, distance yourself from negative comments. Uh, they can really, really have sort of vicarious trauma consequences for, for you and, and uh, for your well-being. So that's just one big thing. Second thing is, yes, there's a lot of negative comments. I, as we said, it's not a, you know, it's not a, a question, it's a fact. There's a lot of trolls on the internet. They hide behind, you know, the internet sort of veil of, uh, I don't know what, not secrecy, but no one knows who they are. So the, the people feel more comfortable with expressing sort of their opinions that they wouldn't otherwise in another, you know, physical public space. So it's important to always remember that. If they're becoming directly threatening comments, you delete them, you, you block them. One thing I will say is that basically with negative comments and with, uh, sort of yeah trolling and stuff like that platforms need to do more than they currently do in monitoring that themselves yes we can report it but there's only so much that we can report and there's you know a lot of people there's one person doing everything on digital in a lot of organizations so like you can't possibly create strategies create content do paid also monitor all the comments report them like these platforms need to be get better at becoming safe spaces for a lot of people and I think because their businesses they haven't really been prioritizing that um, and particularly I think it's really complicated for um, not complicated it has a way bigger effect on on women particularly women of color uh, the trolling just gets out of control and things like that so um, I would say a distance yourself um, from some of these negative comments don't look at them I've stopped looking at comments at amnesty I yeah unless you get specific support and that's sort of part of your job don't do it um because it, it's not great for you um and then second is if you're seeing something that is constructive for example if you're seeing something like that that, that you think might help you change your strategy and and, and this constructive criticism then do take it into account and that's why we were talking about you know that growth sprint and adapting and testing and and things like that but just be careful that's very good advice. Self-care, uh, taking care of ourselves uh, mentally and physically is something uh, um, that we all should, should keep in mind, especially in, when it comes to uh, social media. Uh, Val, because we have uh, seven more minutes, there's a, a very specific question from Hike about Messenger. Uh, and he's wondering about the legitimacy and credibility of Messenger. Organizations and activists are often targeted by smear campaigns that aim to discredit them. As a result, they operate in situations where public trust towards them is low. Should they continue to be primary messengers or uh, they should find other messengers? But Hike, so sorry, do you mean messengers as a messenger as a as a communicator or messengers as uh, people who produce messages? I think like the spokespeople. I think so too. Because I yeah. first after the first sentence, sorry, I, I understood that you meant messenger as a as a as a tool, as a as a Facebook messaging tool. But um yeah, I think you mean more um I think, yeah. yeah, I think it's really, really, really dependent on your context um of which country you operate in um and what you, you're doing. I would be less worried about credibility 
to be completely honest, and more about security when I when I'm looking at sort of spokespeople and 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 the messengers of certain campaigns. To be completely honest, and less about how credible they are, because if they work for us, they're credible. And a lot of places, uh, and maybe I'll answer the TikTok question. Um, the reason that IFRC so uh, Red Cross have been so incredibly good at TikTok is because they've been bringing experts, researchers, policy people, advocacy people onto TikTok to give solid educational advice to young people. And no other messenger would have been able to do that, right? Because there is a certain level of authority and understanding. And, and no matter how much people try to discredit people within organizations, it doesn't matter because essentially what we need to understand is that the better we are, the clearer we are with our message messaging, the clearer we are with what we want to achieve and what we want to say, the easier it is for these people to, to sort of, I think it's much easier and better if you have human beings that represent organizations. Of course, it's important to have organizational voice and tone as I was talking about it already, but it's also important to have human beings that bring that authority um, into you know, the public sphere and show that you, know, you as an organization you have those people who have that knowledge, who that's their life and their work of, you know, understanding these topics and doing this stuff. But if there are security concerns for people involved, you might need to think about that two times. So the reason that we sometimes go through just the Amnesty channel versus humans um, who work for Amnesty is if they're, if, for example, if they publicly say something, then it won't be safe for them to do their research. Or if, if they're an activist, then it might not be safe to them to go back home or what to go to, to sort of operate within their activism sphere or, or, or operate at home or anything like that. So. Mm -hmm. uh, Val, there's also Miha has a question about TikTok, but uh, we have four minutes and I have gotten through the back channels. I've also gotten a question about uh, sort of how do you, this a little bit relates to self-care, but how do you, you mentioned a lot of um, uh, content that you produce different types of content reacting to what's happening in the world, reactive in a creative way. Uh, but then the question often appears that how can we do it if there's just one of us, right? Or per organization that doesn't necessarily exclusively work on social media. So one thing would be uh, out of curiosity, because we asked you, this, asked you this before, how big the team is that you're working with, but also how do you keep, no matter how many people, how do you keep the sort of the creativity? How do you keep the flow of new ideas? Uh, oh, can be tiring. really good, really good um, advice I was given. Um, by a friend of mine, Nadine, who used to work for Amnesty, uh, Mina, she said, do it and say sorry later. Because I think um, our biggest, uh, the thing that stifles our creativity the most is when people say no, right? You come up with an idea and then someone's like, no, actually policy-wise, can't say that. Um, and I think that's why it's super important for, if, if you're a small team, if, if you're one person doing social media, is to develop your own editorial understanding of policy and, and things like that and really be sort of, know when to ask for permission and know when to just uh, trust yourself in your judgment of what you want to do. And I think that's what makes you most creative, to be completely honest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the yeah. team? Uh, how big is the team? Uh, what did I say last time? No, you said that it's it's you and two other people. Because <laughs> yeah. we were like, oh no, Amnesty, you must have a huge like room of people working on all this content. So I actually no longer do social media. Uh, and my wonderful colleague, um, Somia and Sharon, um, are now the two people in the social media team. Uh, one is a reactive producer. So Sharon is a reactive producer and Somia is the social media manager. Um, so they take it forward. So only two people. Um, and then digital, we're quite a few. There's there's only one paid marketing specialist. There's only one supporter engagement sort of specialist. Um, but but the team is we have a lot of infrastructure sort of focused people. So as I was saying, like Google Analytics, website, CRM, all this stuff. Um, because I think personally now with my new hat as head of digital, I think it's equally important to focus on both engagement but also on infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So how well are you prepared to be able to implement? And as someone asked earlier, track your performance, right? So mm -hmm. I would say um, that's why we're sort of divided along these lines, but engagement wise, we're not yeah, that big of a team.
Because I think the worry here is that because everything you do sounds so amazing and so well thought through, the worry of people that might be watching us is that, okay, but there's there's just one of me or there's just like two of us working on this. And so clearly we cannot have an operation uh, uh, working as uh, professionally as, uh, as you do. But I, I guess from what you said, there are things that you can do no matter how many, how big your team is, right? You, when you prepare your strategy. Yeah. To and it's about time uh, management, right? It's about planning your time so that, you know, before jumping into a campaign, you just take a step back and think about it a bit. Wonderful. Um, okay, so it's 2 p.m. Um, on the dot, uh, and we are very mindful of everyone's time in the spirit of uh, self-care and uh, well-being and our Zoom fatigue. Uh, so Val, thank you so, so much again for joining us. This was thank extremely you. valuable, and I think I don't speak for myself. We can tell from the activity of everyone who joined asking questions. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you to everyone who participated, who submitted their questions, who commented. Uh, like I mentioned, and um, we will be sending a recording of this uh, and Val's presentation, link to Val's presentation uh, in an email, um, but feel, feel, as well as Val's handles and uh, uh, contact information, so you'll be able to contact her directly. Uh, but yes, thank you so, so much. And uh, hopefully see you next Thursday when uh, Cassie uh, will take us through how to make video content and Cassie actually works with Val. So is there a better recommendation? I don't think exactly. so. Exactly. <laughs> okay, thank you all so, so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.